Mini episode 874 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 874. Two of your original FDH Lounge dignitaries getting together today to talk football, specifically the 2017 NFC season. Rick Morris and Chris Galloway breaking this all down. We broke down the AFC in number 873 and dropped a little bit of breadcrumbs there at the end about the Super Bowl. And at the end of this one here, we'll be giving you our thoughts on how the Super Bowl is going to go exactly because we'll each be able to name an NFC champion by that time. We start the NFC East, and it's a situation where I don't think I've ever done anything that is as huge of a cop-out as what I'm about to do now. Now, it is a thing where we all know that a lot of times a team can make the playoffs because of the the grid of tiebreakers and realistically not be as good of a, a, a team as some of the teams that, that missed it. The most infamous example is... In 2002, that's the only season in four seasons that the New England Patriots missed winning the Super Bowl. They were edged out of the playoffs by the 0-2 Cleveland Browns. That will always be probably the foremost example of what I'm talking about here. So my AFC East winner, I think they might even only be the third best team in the AFC East. But by process of elimination, again, low-hanging fruit... I have referred to this in 873. The Giants and Dallas both made it last year. There are some things where you can kind of look for a little bit of the, the regression potentially in Dallas, I think, has been very obvious with the offseason headlines. Elliott, all the things going on there. The potential for fallback is very obvious, plus Dak Prescott having to go out there and do it again when the league is better adjusted to him. The Giants, as gigantic as a step forward as they took defensively last year, might there be a little bit of give back on that? It's hard to sustain that big of an improvement. Washington's the team that I would have picked to win the division, all things considered, but I am very, very down on that organization right now. I'm very down on the Redskins with, with purging Scott McClellan from there. I really thought that, again, if Dan Snyder could have kept his own ego in check, left a great pro football mind at the helm there, I think that the real damage is going to come beyond this season, but I think the dysfunction is already just getting to a level there where my pick for the division in a division full, I believe, literally, literally full of 8-8 eight and eight teams. Out of those four, I'm going to pick Philadelphia at 8-8 eight and eight to win the AFC East, completely by default. I think they're going to get enough from Carson Wentz. I think that with some of the tweaks that they've had going on on both sides of the ball, increased skill position, uh, talent, uh, defensively, I think they've upgraded in enough areas. Can Doug Peterson get them to 8-8? Eight and eight? I believe so. And in a division of four 8-8 eight eight teams as I see it, Philly, to me, is not the best, but Philly, to me, is going to win the AFC East. Uh, that's amazing, because I really see that, that division very similarly. Um, I think you have four teams that are all pretty much in Kentucky within a game of each other. Um, I think somebody, and I'm going to make a prediction, will win the division at 9-7, and seven. Um, but then the other the other three teams will be 9-7, 8-8, and, seven, eight and, eight, and they're all going to be right there. And that doesn't mean that they're not good teams. I think in some ways, the you know, the NFC East, uh, outside of the mm-hmm. NFC East, may actually be the, the the best division in terms of overall top-to-bottom competitiveness and talent. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead in this division and say that the Cowboys are going to finish 9-7, and seven, but they're going to lose the tie break, and, and that's going to go to the Giants. Um, in the end, the Giants have two two advantages. One, um, you've got an experienced quarterback in Eli Manning, and I know at times, uh, you know, Eli can be frustrating, but I feel like Eli's ready for another one of those years where you like you start to sour on Eli, and then all of a sudden he like rises up and has a great season. Um, with that defense, that Giants defense is the 
real deal. And and I, if defense wins championships, defense should at least win you a division championship. So I, I'm going to go with the Giants. Cowboys are going to take a step back, especially in terms of record. I mean, that defense is shaky. Um, the, the Zeke Elliott, uh, you know, situation is a bit of a mess and a distraction. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, I'm just, I'm just not a believer in Jason Garrett's ability to get this team beyond being basically a, you know, I feel like he's the new Jeff Fisher. You know, <laughs> eight and eight. He's going to be there a long time with the Cowboys going seven and nine to ten and six, somewhere in that range, you know, every year. Um, Lastly, um, I think also competitive right there at nine and seven Eagles. Uh, I think they're going to be nine and seven. I think they've really improved some of their talent on on, on both sides of the ball, and um, I like the, tra- the trajectory of that team. Unlike most people who have got you know, and, and if you recall from the draft, I was an early believer in Carson Wentz and liked Carson Wentz. Yes, I still believe he is going to be a very good Pro Bowl quarterback. But I will say, he tailed off an awful lot last year. And I think there's still a bit of, sh- you know, you got to show me something. Um, and so, I, 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 the reason I don't want to go beyond 9-7 and seven with the Eagles is because everything with Carson Wentz is still projection. We're still projecting how he should be. Um, and we haven't seen it yet. He started off the first four games great, and then he tailed off over the last 12. Uh, and by the end of the season, he was, you know, one of the lower-rated quarterbacks in the league. So, you know, again, everybody sort of has the Eagles. Some people that are high on the Eagles are high on them because they, they believe, you know, Carson Wentz is on his way to a Pro Bowl-type season. If he may very well be, but then again, he may very well be not be. So I think for that reason, you you got to pencil them in at about 9-7. and seven. Competing right down to the end of the to, to the tie breaks, just like the way you envision it. And then lastly, also competing right at the end of the Redskins, um, they're there because of Kirk Cousins. He will sling that ball for 4,400 yards this year. He'll sling it all over the place. He's going to have great fantasy numbers. And um, But like you, I don't believe in the Redskins because of organizational dysfunction. They are a train wreck. And, and I... I can't elevate them beyond eight and eight. Uh, Kirk get them uh, enough offensive, uh, you know, scores to keep them in the games. They'll win some that they shouldn't. They'll lose some that they shouldn't, uh, and it'll be an eight and eight. When you have a, you know, when you have a GM that doesn't know your quarterback's name isn't Kirk. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm sorry, you're just you're just a mess, and you you know you don't deserve you don't deserve nice things, Washington. And I say that as more than just being a Cowboys fan. You know, Washington, you just don't deserve nice things. So I'm with you. I, I got nine and seven, three nine and seven teams, one eight and eight team, a lot of parity, um, but some good football teams in there with the Giants winning out a tie break um, on the strength of that defense and, and Eli Manning, some late inning, some late quarter uh, magic uh, of old. And then getting just enough to win the division and get into the playoffs. I think so. And as far as it goes with Philadelphia, the, the one thing that we can hope for is that if the Eagles do have a division championship, that uh, that this will somehow boost uh, the NFL's most entertaining YouTube star, EDP four four five. I'd love to see him get a network gig here, maybe on one of the pregame shows. Granted, you'd have to bleep every third word that comes out of his mouth, maybe every second word that comes out of his mouth, but. Seeing that big fat guy ranting and raving on national television uh, is the treat that we all need. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> yes, I want to see that. Make it happen, networks. So we come to the NFC North, and I referred to this briefly when we were talking about the AFC. We'd gone through the AFC East, the AFC North, and I said, these are two of the more divisions that appear cut and dried, I think. The rest of the way, looking at the eight divisions in the league, you're not going to find that as much except for the NFC North. I, I think there appears to be a strong consensus out there, at least as far as the top of the division goes. Maybe there's a little bit of uh, shake-up once you get a little bit further down in there, but uh, I'm going to make the boring chalk pick like everybody else, Green Bay, to win the division at 11-5. I would have them a little bit stronger, but for the schedule that they have, it's not a brutal schedule, but it didn't look to me necessarily that conducive to 13-3 and 
or in that ballpark. So I've got them settling in at 11 and 5, winning the division comfortably, somewhat akin to the Steelers in the AFC North, who I have winning the division by three games. I got them winning it by three games over Minnesota at 8 and 8. I think that's going to shake out to be, again, a, a respectable season there, but frustrating probably given the way that expectations have been increased the last couple of years in Minnesota. The way they fell apart down the stretch, especially defensively and some of the finger-pointing internally, I think there may be some lasting ramifications over that. I look at the bottom of the division, and i got a couple of teams in there. One team that's better than people think, and another team that is worse than people think. I look for a little bit of give back from the Detroit Lions from last year. I think it's going to be a 6-10 and 10 campaign. I think they still have some holes uh, in that roster. They're not exactly a stars and scrubs scenario, but not a team that I look at as being very deep necessarily. Grave concerns about the rushing game with Amir Abdullah as being the number one guy who has been very, very unproven in his time in the league. The Bears at 6-10 and 10, I think could be a lot like the Browns in terms of being better than their record. I think the Bears could be very respectable, particularly if they do the right thing and they go with Mike Glennon for a long stretch of the way, if not the entire season. That's what they got him there for. He's been one of the better backups in the league the last couple of years, which means, again, he's one of the guys, I think when you get to about 20 to 40 in the NFL when you're ranking the quarterbacks, it's kind of a grab bag. The lower end starters, the higher end backups. I think Glennon is, is more towards the high 20s, even though he's been a backup the last couple of years to, to Winston out of necessity. So I think the Bears can ride him there. It's an unspectacular roster, but it's one that doesn't necessarily have a lot of glaring holes as I see it. I guess I differ from a lot of people that still see it as being dotted with holes. I think they have less holes that are glaring up and down the roster than Detroit does, but I've got them both at 6-10. and 10. Yeah, I'm going uh, I, I, to start with this division at the bottom. Um, I'm with you, the Bears. Um, I would, in my head, they're a five and eleven team, a lot like the Browns. Um, I believe that they will play Mike Glennon. I think Fox wants to commit to Glennon because if you know he's a guy that likes veterans, and um, I think Fox will play Glennon for at least the first eight weeks. At some point, when they are, you know, three and five or two and six. You know, after eight weeks, the screaming for Trubisky is going to be so loud that um, I believe that the front office will force Fox's hand and tell him, "I don't care what you, you know, what you want to do. You're going to play Trubisky." So look for that somewhere mid-season. The Bears to switch, maybe get a temporary bump out of it. Struggle as you always typically do with a rookie quarterback. Although, as you know, I'm high on Trubisky. I really wanted the Browns to find a way to get him. Um, last season, uh, I was fine. You know, I was I, I was okay with the Garrett pick because on paper it, it was the quote unquote no brainer, and it's hard not to say, well, don't take that pick. Although, obviously, you know, my biggest question mark that I always had with Garrett was injury, and is he going to stay healthy with those you know those ankles and feet and everything right. stay on the field? Look, if he's I mean, we saw it in the preseason. If, if, if Garrett's healthy, he's going to be a beast. Um, but again. Is he going to stay on the field? I'm still not 100 sure of that. So, Trubisky is the future of that franchise. I, I, to be, and I know this probably seems like heresy to some people. I put his ceiling somewhere in that, you know, Aaron Rodgers area. Um, Aaron Rodgers is a great Hall of Fame quarterback, and Trubisky has all the same skill set. Now, that doesn't mean he'll ever live up to it. It doesn't mean you know he's not on a dysfunctional franchise over time or injuries somehow plague him. But he has those same skills that Rodgers has. And, and so if handled correctly, you could see um, that kind of ceiling for Trubisky. I, I believe that, and that's not just my North Carolina homerism. Um, I, I truly do believe it. I think you saw some of that in the preseason um, out of the youngster. Yes. So missed opportunity for the Browns. But um, I think the Bears are at the bottom. I think they're 5-11. You know, um, I think that that roster, like you said, is not spectacular, but it's it's not um, New York Jets, you know, cringeworthy. Right, right. Uh, taking a step up, you know, the Lions. Here's uh, here's what I'm going to say about the Lions. You know, everybody says. I mean, I just just had a whole long conversation. We talked about the AFC about you know it's a quarterback league. It is a quarterback. They have their quarterback. The most the, the most expensive quarterback in the league history, Matt Stafford, and he's going to put up video game numbers again as he always does. 
Um, but I will say this, that team is going to go as far as Amir Abdullah takes them. Um, that he's got to stay healthy, and he's got to rush for 1,200 yards. He's got to show what I think is in him, but only if he can stay healthy and stay on the field and play 16 games. If he plays 16 games, the, the, the Lions are going to compete for a playoff spot. If he's good for eight, they're not going to compete for a playoff spot. Um, because Stafford band a lot of issues with that roster and has for years. Um, and, and the same goes again this year. Um, they will they will challenge for a playoff spot with, with Abdullah being the deciding factor. If he stays healthy and goes for 1,200 yards that he's capable of, 1,300 yards, they're going to they're gonna have a real shot at the playoffs. Um, here's where I'm gonna. Here's where I'm gonna throw the, the curve. Um, the Packers. I'm picking them to finish second, and and the reason is um, I hate that defense. Defense. I mean, what did they do in the off season that really gave you any confidence that they can stop anybody? Um, that defense is a, a, just a leaking sieve, and I don't. I just don't think you can win a championship with that defense. And you know, and they got hot at the end of the year because of Aaron Rodgers. Once again, you know, that Packers roster, I'm not really in love with it other than Aaron Rodgers. Um, they've got some good players. I think Jordy Nelson, I mean, look, I like the receiving court. Devontae Adams, Jordy Nelson, I think, is going to have a career year. Watch for him. He is going to have an amazing fantasy year. Um, I think Adams is going to have a great year. I think Ty Montgomery's a real talent. Nobody can doubt that that team can put points on the board at will. The problem is their defense might as well just be, you know, the uh, the the uh, running of the bulls. Ole! Bumped <laughs> into the end zone. Um, you know, they just I, they're, every game with Packers is going to be a 42-38 shootout kind of scenario. And so, if Jordy Nelson goes down with injury, or Adams goes down, or God forbid, you know, that uh, Rogers got hurt, they're, I, they're done. Um, they have to outscore everybody. And history tells us teams that have to put up 40 points a game um, usually end up underperforming. That said, I'm going to go with the Vikings um, for first place um, for two reasons. One, I like their defense far more. They can't put up the same type of numbers with Sam Bradford that, they, that the Packers can with their weapons. But I believe that Michael Floyd will come back and perform pretty well after his suspension in his home state. Um, I think that um, Sam Bradford gives them really good quarterback play. He played really well last year. Uh, and that was a tough spot being traded eight days before the start of the season. Um, so look for um, their, uh, their uh, was it Kyle Randolph, their... their uh, Rudolph, Ryan. yeah. Rudolph, yeah, sorry. Uh, he's going to have a, a really good year. Bradford's going to go to him repeatedly. Um, he's going to be his go-to guy, uh, and I think that the Vikings are, with the strength of that defense, and, and getting just enough out of Bradford and and, and what they have the skill positions. Uh, I, I love, you know, getting Dalvin Cook. They're going to have a running game again. Um, I think that they're going to edge out by probably one game. They're going to edge out the Packers to win that division um, because they have a defense. Very interesting. Yeah, I would say their their defense is clearly better. I looked it up while you were talking here. Green Bay's defense a year ago, 20th in DVOA. So in looking at it, again, I'm not overwhelmed by their defense either, but in, in my mind, and, and, and this is foreshadowing a little bit, I think they've got a good playoff run in them. I won't say at the moment exactly where, but... If, if they can get to even about 16th in DVOA, somewhat to me kind of reminiscent of the 2009 Saints. Because that was the year, if you remember, that defense, it wasn't a liability. It was, it was basically it was a, a pretty average defense. The offense did the rest. I think if you're a Packer fan, you have to be rooting for that scenario because that, that's the realistic scenario to a long run is to do it like the 09 Saints did. Well, listen, I'm not, I'm listening to Packers. I, I have the Packers getting into the playoffs. Okay. Um, and I have them. I have them either tie break or in my mind, you know, maybe one game behind the Vikings. They're going to be right there. Being competitive. It's not like you know the pack. I'm saying the Packers are going to be eight and eight and struggling. Um, that offense is really, really good. Yes. Um, this but just that in. defense. I just I, you tell me. 
tell me that they were 20th, I, I, my eyeballs tell me they were worse than that. Um, especially when they were playing teams that could, that could put up points. So I, you know, I give the advantage to the Vikings just because of, I think they have a better defense that'll keep them in games, um, and, and allow, uh, you know, some of their, some of their newly acquired talent, like, like guys like Cook, um, to give them a chance to win, to win ball games. Well, and they're, they're, they've got a guy in there that I predicted when he was drafted was was going to be really kind of a force multiplier, and it's funny because you saw it for one half of the NFC Championship game that year up in Seattle. Ha ha, Clinton Dix. It doesn't happen enough to where he really wrecks enough havoc to where he can lift the rest of his team, but they have a guy in there that if he can put it together, if he can have a career year, uh, that almost single-handedly could lift that defense up to at least a mediocre level. Well, I, I like I like Dix. Um, I was a big fan of his um, coming out of college, but I don't. I like you. You know, you and I frequently, uh, especially off here, talk about the, the force multiplier. Where if you have a roster of B minus players, they can become B plus if you have three or four or one at each level. That's an A plus player. Yep. Uh, and that and you don't need a whole roster of A plus players. That that's been New England secret for so many years. Um, and then why, when you see them go elsewhere, that you know, it's always like, well, they're never quite as good. Right. You know, it's, they've got one player at each level that's exceptional that makes all the rest of them better. Dix is certainly that guy, but he can't do it himself. I actually think the Packers' defense is probably going to be worse than they were last year. Well, if they will, if they are uh, worse than last year, uh, then there's no uh, hope for uh, my scenario to play out on what I think is going to be the case with them. Uh, We shall see when we get into our predictions a little bit more. We get to the NFC South, and I'm going to make a uh, a little bit of a comparison here, and it's interesting. These are the two teams that met in Super Bowl, uh, what was it, uh, 35, I think, uh, or 34, Oakland and Tampa Bay. Those are both teams that, uh, again... The, the hardcore uh, stat analysts out there are down on this year. They think that uh, they're very much hipster favorites. Uh, I know FDH football analyst Kyle Ross would be cringing upon hearing this, that I am picking Tampa Bay to win the NFC South. I am buying the hype. A lot of what we said about Mariota before, I would apply to Jameis Winston as well. And even if his development is not as quite, quite as far down the tracks, the weaponry that he has at the moment, at the very least, is better than what Mariota has, even though Mariota's had upgraded toys to play with. But what's there in Tampa Bay is just superlative. If they figure out what's going on with the running game here, and that is an if, and, and if I were them, I would have invested some assets in the offseason to hedging against Doug Martin. I could have potentially picked them for the Super Bowl if I didn't have any questions about that. That's how high I am on Tampa Bay. That defense last year a lot of times was sneaky good. I've got them winning the division. I've got, of course, Atlanta making it back in. Because, again, when I talk about low-hanging fruit and teams where if you even hedge on them, in the NFC, Atlanta is not one of those teams. They've got a a good enough roster here to where you know they're going to make it back in, whether it be as a division champion or as a wild card. Year two of the Dan Quinn defense, we saw it especially in the second half of the season, the way that they measured up and the way that they came on strong. When you've got a guy in there like Vic Beasley, who is, again, clearly one of those force multiplier type players, Atlanta, the future is definitely bright for them. I see another playoff season ahead of them, even if I see Tampa Bay eclipsing them at the top of the division. Carolina 9-7, and seven, I've got them uh, as being a team that could potentially make the playoffs here, but uh, I see them not making it. Uh, vis-a-vis a tiebreaker. I think they're going to be there, but uh, I continue to have questions about Cam Newton. Now with his health and the, the potential hangover of the questions of his health coming into this season here, that's that's a team where I just really have questions about them. I knew they were going to regress from last year. I, I didn't know it was going to be as severe as it ended up being. And again, I have a hard time projecting much being better for them there. New Orleans Saints, I got them at 7-9. and nine. Pretty much, I mean, the, the Saints the last five or six years have kind of been what they've been. You, you know the offense, the firepower is going to be there. We talked about it before with Tom Brady. Drew Brees is another guy where uh, he has managed to defy father time. And uh, I don't even see any of the hints as far as cracks in the armor with him that you alluded to with Brady. Uh, again, you get to that age and it can happen quickly. You know, Time moves at you fast, as that one commercial says, or maybe I'm paraphrasing. But it could happen to Breeze, but I think he's going to have another really strong season. 
the defense, maybe not the liability that it usually is there, but uh, I see them being nine and seven, or I'm sorry, seven and nine, albeit a, a respectable seven and nine. But that's how I see it shaking out. Tampa Bay at the top, Atlanta second, but both of them making the playoffs. I, I this division is the best in football. I yes. mean, without, I mean, top to bottom, the best in football. Um, I would you. I've got the in my mind. I've got the Buccaneers winning, and um, I think that they're going to edge out the Falcons, who are going to have another good year. I think the Falcons are going to drop off a bit offensively without Shanahan at the helm. Now, I know they're going to do a lot of the same things. They're going to run a similar system. But um, I can see the narratives being, you know, in week six, somebody, you know, I can imagine on the talking heads on the show saying, saying, you know, what's wrong with the Falcons? Why are they not as good? You can see it, the hangover from the Super Bowl, the 28-3, to everywhere they go getting trolled by fan bases. Um, I, I just think that, you know, for a team like the Falcons, I say that because it's almost like there's nowhere to go but down, even though they're going to be better on defense and they have all the same weapons. You think, boy, they should be, you know, 14 and 2, you know, they should be a juggernaut. But usually what happens with those teams after a Super Bowl, we know historically, there's always some bit of a hangover, win or lose the Super Bowl, and there's almost always a step back. And, and I think history will, will, will show that again. Um, and I think it'll sort of be, it'll be hung on, um, you know, on the fact that Shanahan's gone. And um, so I like the Bucks to edge out the Falcons. I think, you know, Jameis has got a bunch of weapons there. I think they've got a solid defense. And I think, you know, and, I, and I say this, it's going to be close, but if you look at um, the Buccaneers, you know, they've beaten the Falcons three out of the last four times they've played. Yeah. And... This season, the Buccaneers get, um, you know, a late November game with Atlanta at home, um, you know, you know, with a, uh, you know, with 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 Atlanta coming off a, a Monday night game in Seattle, they got a shot right there to, to, to punch them in the mouth and and take that division um, going into December and, and take control of it, and I think they will. Um, and then, um, you know, I think actually I think the Saints are going to again have that great offense. I'm with you, Drew Brees. Does not there? There's no cracks in, in the facade at all. Um, I think it's going to be another classic Drew Brees season. They, there's certainly, I mean, I love their talent at the running game. Mark Ingram is going to lead the Saints in total yards uh, from scrimmage, not Adrian Peterson, but A, but A, you know, AD will, will provide a lot of fun. A lot of buzz, you know, sort of the he's back kind of thing. He's going to have those moments, and and, and they're going to run football back. Um, a guy I know you like, Alvin Kamara. Um, I, I think he's going to be the new Darren Sproles in the league, and um, so they've got some talent back there, and they're going to score points again. That defense is going to be better, but I think they're going to be a lot like the Packers, you know, every week having to win forty to thirty eight. Um, and, and that's, you know, and, and it's hard to, it's hard to win 12, 13 games when, when you're that kind of a team. And then lastly, the, the Panthers, um, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that Newton, um, back last year, uh, you know, he still is to somewhat is, is in some ways still just not comfortable being a pocket quarterback who doesn't run as much and, and trying to be that guy. And then also, you know, constantly whining about how, you know, the, the, the referees let people hit him. Um, I, I think you're going to see a season just like last year out of him. Um, good moments of greatness, a lot of average, um, and everybody's scratching their head saying, why isn't he better? The real star of that team, I think, by the end of the season is going to be Christian McCaffrey. Yes. Uh, I, I, I picked him on my fantasy. I mean, he's not going to get the bulk of the yards. Um, you know, in, in that attack, but they're going to use him in so many ways from third down to, you know, uh, short five-yard passes to putting him in the slot. I mean, they're going to move him around, and, and he's going to do damage all, all over the place. He's one of those guys, when he's on the field, 
defensive coordinators are going to have to account for, which should hopefully open up the field for guys like Kelvin Benjamin, you know, in the long in the long game, um, and allow Newton to, to to throw the ball down the field effectively. Um, but um, you know, I still don't think the Panthers are anything more than, than say in any uh, football team. Um, because, you know, again, I'm a big Keekly fan, but as he can stay healthy, he can stay on the field. Um, that defense is all about is all about him. If he's healthy, they'll be better. If he's if he misses games, they're they're not going to be so good. Absolutely, um, he is a he is he is a great example of the force multiplier. Um, when he's in there, that defense is totally different. And it's a lot like you know. Um, how things were for years with the, uh, with the murderer Ray Lewis in Baltimore. <laughs> um, he, you know, he was a great example of a first multiplier, and you can see in Baltimore that how missing him um, has changed the, the, the makeup of that defense. So she thinks it was with Keekly. Right, Keekly. So I've got I've that? got the Buccaneers edging out the Falcons, and then the Saints and Panthers um, bringing up the rear in what is the best division, top to bottom, in football. Yeah. I think that's definitely uh, a good likelihood as far as how it shakes out. And when you look at the Saints here, I, I was struck by this, that uh, a discussion that we had on the show in the spring, uh, one of my favorite, uh, very interesting recurring guests that we've had on over the years, uh, political commentator, author, voiceover artist, etc., Ellis Hennigan, uh, he, he was on the show, and he, of course, co-wrote Sean Payton's uh, book some years ago after they won the Super Bowl, and I, I said to him, I basically like, no offense, but like when you look at the last five or six years of that team, don't you just basically kind of see the same thing, and you look ahead to this year, and even he really kind of admitted that, you know, that it's not necessarily what he wants to say as a, fa- a Saints fan and a New Orleans native, but, uh, you know, even the hardcores know it when they look at that team there. I mean, the Saints kind of are what they are in this division. you got Tampa and Atlanta that still have upside Carolina, like you said, a year like last year, I would kind of guess. But but New Orleans, it just really is Groundhog Day. It seems like with them, uh, that's a good way to put it. Groundhog Day. Uh, they uh, they are uh, they're an eight and eight, nine and seven team in my in my eyes. Oh, and, and and that's what keeps them from being seven and nine is the slightly improved defense. Well, and uh, Ellis was, uh, he was he was psyched. He asked me about uh, getting uh, Lattimore in the draft there, and I told him what a big steal that was. So, you know, I, I think they're definitely going to benefit from that. But, uh, you know, one guy does not a defense make. So uh, for New Orleans, it's going to be a process to try to get back to where they are and a race against time in terms of Drew Brees having something left. So we go to the NFC West, the last of the divisions for us to break down uh, in the league. And uh, this is one where, again, I think to a lot of people – Broadly speaking, it kind of seems like a cut-and-dried kind of a thing. I will sort of concur with that myself. Seattle, obviously, to win the division, as most people would say, I got them at 11-5. and five. Much like Green Bay, if the schedule was a little bit softer, not that it's super difficult, but if it was a little softer, I could see going a little bit higher. I got Arizona at 9-7 and seven and basically sneaking into the playoffs here, more or less because I have to pick a second playoff team in the NFC and Usually, it's I'm not picking somebody by default with the sixth uh, team the way that I am in the AFC, but here I kind of am. I think that there's a chance that Palmer has enough left in the tank, enough of a rebound year here. Uh, an interesting wide receiving core. They really underachieved last year, except for Fitzgerald, who gave you everything he has at his age. I, I think that they can bounce back enough. Bruce Arians has shown a capacity to be able to lift his teams beyond what the Pythagorean stats will tell you they can do for a year, and I think you may see a little bit of that again this year. I got them at 9 and 7. 7 and 9, I tell you what, uh, the intelligentsia across the football world will tell you that the Chargers are going to have the better season than the Rams this year. I do not agree. I have the Rams at 7 and 9, whereas I have the Chargers at 6 and 10. I, I think Sean McVay has got them pointed in the right direction. It's going to be tough going without uh, Aaron Donald for whatever period of time, but uh, I think this is a team that is going to be playing uh, better than they did under Jeff Fisher, who ironically, uh, as you pointed out earlier, was the king of 7-9. and nine. But 7-9 uh, and nine would represent, I think, a triumph for the Rams coming off of where they were last year. I'm still a believer I'm in Jared glad Goff. You described, I'm glad you gave a good description on the Rams, because I was about to tell you, 7-9, and nine, why'd they get rid of Fisher? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and you mentioned it before about uh, 
the, the situation in uh, with uh, Jason Garrett in Dallas. The NFL now that they've gone to this whole showbiz kind of a thing night before the Super Bowl awards ceremony here. I look forward to the, uh, Jason Garrett at one day uh, receiving the Jeff Fisher uh, Lifetime uh, Imitation Award that Jeff Fisher can himself bestow upon him and pass the crown to him during one of these award ceremonies here and fulfill your prediction for him. But 7-9 and nine I think would be uh, an upgrade for the Rams, certainly off of last year, certainly off what people are expecting. Uh, Jared Goff Again, I am uh, a bitter clinger, as I have said on the show to Kyle Ross many times when he and I have been talking football, and as I expect to say many times in the future. I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong on Jared Goff yet, although he's, he's making me uh, you know, have to uh, reach a little bit here. But I think he's going to have a better year than people are expecting. San Francisco, I got at 4-12. and 12. Uh, I would have expected to pick them at 2-14 and 14 or somewhere in that ballpark a while ago. They've done enough around the margins as far as upgrading some talent to at least get passable here and there. Uh, they've, they've got Brian Hoyer, who has worked successfully with Kyle Shanahan as far as it goes in the past here. I think they can probably get the 4-12 and 12 and do just well enough to screw themselves out of a chance to get Sam Darnold next year in the draft. So, uh, Although, again, there will be chances to get Josh Rosen, Josh Allen, other guys like that in that mix. They'll, they'll clearly be able to take one of those guys next year, but... That's how I see the West shaking out. I generally agree with you on that. Um, I'll start at the bottom just to mix it up. Um, San Francisco, I would imagine about 4-12 and 12 is about right for them. Um, Shanahan will improve that team. I mean, I love their you know, I love their picks of Solomon Thomas and Ruben Foster. Yeah. Um, the defense is going to get better real fast, um, not necessarily this year, but in the next couple of years, as they add more guys like that. Um, you know, Brian Hoyer's a one-year guy. You know, you know, God, you know, San Francisco will be the play action of the uh, of the West, um, and and it'll be. Um, and you don't have to worry about missing that on Sam Donald or anybody else. Um, he has his eyes on Kirk Cousins making the trip west, um, and, and I think that's the most likely outcome in the off season that the 49ers will sign Cousins, uh, unless of course the Redskins find a way to actually franchise him yet again <laughs> you know Kirk says all the right things but he knows that that, that, that the Redskins are a dysfunctional shit show and he's not going to he's not going to stick around for that. Right. Um, so if they if at some point they stop tagging him he's going to leave despite all his talk about how much he wants to stay and sign a long term deal with the Redskins he's not going to um, he and Kyle are probably texting um, you know, every week, you know, uh, uh, like little heart emoticons and things, you know, love you, can't wait to see you, um, you know, flowers in our hair in San Francisco, that sort of thing. So look for that. Um, the aforementioned 7 and 9 Los Angeles Rams. I, I like Sean McVay, good young coordinator. Um, he's not, he doesn't have some of the, the, the character traits of usual young guys that are too young for the job. He, he looks mature beyond his years to yes. me. Um, and, and I think that is going to prove to be a really good hire for the Rams. I'm with you. I think golf will improve. I think the line will be better. I think the receivers will be better. And um, so that will help him. And, and, and I think McVay will help him uh, get a little bit better. Although I'm, you know, I, I think they are a six and 10, you know, type of squad. Um, but improved um, certainly um, than under the stale, you know, old regime with, with Jeff Fisher. Um, that brings us into the Cardinals. David Johnson's going to be a beast again this year. Yep. They've got great talent. Um, but back to, you know, Carson Palmer, you're only going as far as Palmer takes you. And I think he's just, he's just a tired, slow old man at this point. And, and I don't think he's got much left in the tank. And, and for that reason, I don't see the Cardinals leaping over the Seahawks um, to take that division. I see them as sort of 9-7 and seven material and just missing the playoffs. Um, I see the Seahawks winning, you know, being a 10-6 and 11-5 and and type player um, because of Wilson. Um, they could be even better if they had an offensive line that could protect him. Um, I love what they've done in terms of some of their, uh, you know, their town position, getting, uh, you know, training for the tackle with the Jets. Um, it was a big move on their part. 
Um, so I, I think Seattle is the is the class of that division. They're going back to the playoffs, um, and I hope that when uh, Jason Garrett wins the Jeff Fisher Award that you described, I hope that the award is just a it's just a bronzed mustache. <laughs> well. Yeah, or a bronzed bucket of excrement or uh, something like that to truly sum up the career. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see what the NFL design folks come up with there. But uh, yeah, uh, unsurprising that you and I have Seattle winning the division. Here's how I see it shaking out playoff-wise. Uh, we're we're going to see another one of these scenarios where there is a wild card team that is significantly better than the team that they are visiting that weekend. So I, I will have number five, Atlanta, over number four, Philadelphia. Uh, number three, Tampa Bay, over number six, Arizona. Both those games in the wild card round. In the divisional round, things get very interesting. Rematch from last year, Green Bay and Atlanta, but I have it being in Green Bay. Number one, Green Bay, over number five, Atlanta. Number two, Seattle, over number three, Tampa Bay. Don't discount the effect of the weather in that one because uh, it, that, that's something that I think could be very decisive there. I don't think there's a big gap right now between Seattle and Tampa Bay at all. Uh, in a game at Lambeau Field, which I would expect to be decisive, number one, Green Bay over number two, Seattle. And I have, believe it or not, I have Green Bay over New England in the Super Bowl. This is what I compare it to, Chris, another of my uh, famed cross-sport comparisons. Two or three years ago, I did not want to be right about this. I really didn't want to be right about this, being a Clevelander, but I looked at Sid Crosby and I thought, over the trajectory of his career, being the historian that I am, I don't want to see it, but he's got another one or two in him at minimum. And I look at Aaron Rodgers the same way. Aaron Rodgers is not a guy that I see retiring with one Super Bowl title. I just don't. And it's got to come at some point in the next couple of years here. And as you point out, this might not be the most favorable landscape when you look at that defense there. But, uh, you know, the truly great quarterbacks, and I think he, he probably projects to a top five guy all time by the time he's done, if I'm right about the trajectory of his career. The truly great ones have the ability to drag a team across the finish line. I'm not going to necessarily say that's what Drew Brees did in 2009, because like I said, the Saints defense that year with Greg Williams, it wasn't a liability. It was a fairly decent defense, It probably middle of the bell curve. I look for the same out of the Green Bay defense, good enough to where Aaron Rodgers can drag that team over the finish line. Green Bay over New England in the Super Bowl for me. Oh, I, you know, I'm not going to break down the playoff predictions exactly to the level you have, but um, sure. I will cut right to the chase with what people care about. Yeah. An improbable, good for it every five years type of run, Eli Manning gets hot, that defense sucks it up, and the 9-7 and seven Giants team makes a run and makes it all the way to the Super Bowl to play the Pittsburgh Steelers, and so it is a Steelers-Giants Super Bowl. Is Rooney Mara going to throw out the uh, coin? Is she going to do the coin flip at the beginning of the game? That would be fitting, right? Well, well it really would be, and I don't even know who she roots for. <laughs> <laughs> is she got a jersey that like split? Well, um, and it's it's going to be it'll be it look and it's going to be billed as a big legacy game. You know, Eli to get one more than his brother, Big Ben to get another one and solidify the spot in in, in Canton. Um, I, I think you know that being Giants, being New York, Pittsburgh, being one of America's more favorited teams, um, at least the ratings tell us so. Um, it will be a, it will be a, a, an epic matchup, and I think that um, Giants prevail despite the shaky offensive line. Um, they figure out a way in the short passing game to um, to get just enough offense out. And Eli Manning um, gets the bragging rights, one more Super Bowl over his brother. Well, I'll tell you what, too. You, you mentioned about that. Either there's bragging rights for that. There's bragging rights for the class of 04. The only thing we know for sure is that wherever he's watching that game, by the end of the game, Philip Rivers will launch an oversized beer stein at the TV. Yeah, I, I feel bad for Philip. He's, 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 he's the modern-day Dan Marino, a great, great quarterback. Never, you know, Dan at least got to play in the Super Bowl. Rivers is never going to see one. And um, it's unfortunate. And, you know, in some ways at the time, you know, a, a lot of us were super critical of Mannings and the way they forced Eli out of San Diego. 
and they, they and they and he forced his way them to make a trade. But I tell you what, you know, if he wins the third Super Bowl, it's going to be hard to look back and say, boy, they were they were wrong because they'll they'll be have been proven quite right for having done so. Um, because can you imagine? I mean. Philip Rivers has done all he can with that, that spot that he's been in San Diego and been a great trooper. Um, but Eli wouldn't have won Super Bowl um, if he had stayed in San Diego. Well, as far as that goes, as far as his decision goes, I, I flash back to 1999 here in Cleveland, Chris, when you and I were down at the Volstein Center and a diminutive little man was running around on stage yelling, Scoreboard! And as far as that decision goes, what can you say except scoreboard? It has worked out for Eli Manning. It has worked out for the Giants. And, uh, again, it's easy to extrapolate. He and Phillip Rivers, skill set-wise, you can't say one is necessarily that much better than the other. So probably, uh, I would actually tell you that I think Rivers is the better quarterback. More consistent, anyways. But, yeah. But I think, that I think that what he's had around him um, has not allowed him to have the success that Eli has had in New York, because for whatever reason, I mean, they just, the Giants a couple of times rose up and up with, you know, they hit, they hit the Eli, great play out of him in those Super Bowl runs, but um, he had a better supporting cast around him. Um, I, I think that I think that Phillip first is the better quarterback, and he is going to go to Canton, and he's never going to get to play in a Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, and, and Manning, I think, is going to get his third this year, and um, and then it's going to be time to um, he's going to. I, in my opinion, you should really start to, to look at the idea of retiring. Yeah, you might as well because it's a great chance to go out on top. And I, I kind of agree with you in, in a sliding doors Gwyneth Paltrow world here, where Philip Rivers ends up in New York. He's probably the guy who's got multiple Super Bowl titles, and Eli is the uh, the underachiever uh, stuck in his brother's shadow and uh, in later years the same division no less so yeah that would have been uh, an interesting alternate reality to be sure I'll bring it around on this note then if it comes to that with the Super Bowl being the Steelers and the Giants uh, I, I know that a uh, good friend of the show FDH Lounge dignitary Lloyd Carroll who is a sports writer for the Queen's Chronicle uh, Lloyd always loves doing ambush questions of people and I go back to one of his columns from a couple of years ago. I remember feeling very bad for her when I read this, but I think it was Kate Mara that uh, he ambushed in the Giants locker room one time, like asking her about Tom Coughlin's bad play calling, and she looked like a deer in the headlights. So <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of questions. He's going to be hunting for her and for Rooney Mara Super Bowl week, asking them, who do you really want to win the game? So, girls, uh, be ready for that one right now. Uh, Lloyd Carroll is going to be coming your way trying to get you if Chris's scenario comes out. <laughs> All you got to do is look for that shifty guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, um, yep, nope, that's how I see it. I, I, and, again, I see the NFC playoffs. Just to, you know, I didn't really get into it, but I see the playoffs as extremely competitive. Um, and I, and I, just, I think in the end, Defense wins championships. The Giants have a really good defense. Um, I don't think that was a, a mirage or a mistake last year. And and I think Eli rides up to the playoffs and, and and they punch on through. And in, in what most people would find as a shocker, and, and find yourself with the New York Giants as Super Bowl champions edging out the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, and that would—that's uh, not a scenario that's uh, on, on the thoughts of many people right now. Uh, my, my thing with uh, Packers and Patriots is a lot closer to chalk. So uh, props to you for sticking your neck out on that one. And you know, as as for Lloyd Carroll, uh, again, he is somebody who is also famed in New York circles for his love of press buffets at different events. Here, I always say he—he's the one sports writer in New York whose windbreaker pockets smell like shrimp cocktail. <laughs> Yeah, we've all known guys like that, basically. But, uh, yeah, that uh, if, if he ever makes it to the Super Bowl, and uh, I'm sure he'd want to go for that one, look out, media people. But, uh, yeah, an interesting 2017 NFL season ahead of us. Like I said, in 873, we broke down the AFC, 874 on the NFC. And, uh, again, as it has been throughout uh, the long course of the FDH Lounge, for the 10 years plus, uh, going to be coming up on 11 in January. Always a pleasure talking football, and really all things, but we've had a lot of football talk, you and I, on the show, Chris. Thank you again for being on today and breaking these down with me. 
Hey, my pleasure. Until next time. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today for FDH Lounge Mini Episode Number 874. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Paper Mate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 